tell you, well, I'm going to talk really fast because if I talk really fast, then I can get done almost at the time when I was supposed to be done. So if I talk too fast, you just have to raise your hand and say you're going too fast, and then I'll slow down. Okay? <laughs> I'm going too fast. Okay. Uh, as Pri said, I'm with IBM's Thomas J. Watson Research Center. I'm actually, what the, what the date is today? Is it? Is it the 30th? Okay, tomorrow's my last day there. So uh, today I'm representing them here to you with this research. And after tomorrow, then I won't be representing them with this research. But this research will still be published on behalf of them uh, when the rest of the research is done. So anyway, I'm there at the... Uh, I don't know what my new job is yet. haven't decided. Uh, basically, uh, I've been coming to DEF CON since the second DEF CON. Uh, I will slow down. Thank you. And I'm here to talk today about something that I just called the end of innocence because there have been a lot of changes in the whole scene with computer viruses since I started coming to DEF CON. I also have this shirt which I was going to wear which the code breakers guys gave me so since I can't wear it I'll show it to you and you can pretend I'm wearing it. Um, the front of it says code breakers. The back of it says justice for Dave. This is Dave Smith, who says he wrote the Melissa virus, who's facing a long jail time and a lot of big fine. And I'm going to talk about that toward the end of this presentation, because this presentation is kind of about what is justice in a society where we don't really know the impact of our actions on a really widely distributed systems. What, what made me start doing this research now was I started reading things in the newspaper and in magazines. And this stuff really makes me nuts. I read this, this quote which said, this case, the company says, and I won't name the company here, but I will be in the paper, proves that virus writing, that means writing the virus, is indeed illegal, despite arguments to the contrary. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I see somebody telling me it's illegal to write something on my own computer in my own home, and that it's indeed, indeed illegal despite what other people say, that kind of worries me when people start thinking that what I write on my own computer is any of their business, really. I get more nuts when I read things like, this prosecution, that prosecution being that of David L. Smith, will be a decisive event that will tend to reduce the relentlessly increasing threat and resulting to risk of computer viruses to society as a whole. I read this statement and I thought, what's this based on? How do we know that this prosecution is going to really reduce the increasing threat? Had there been any scientific research to show whether these types of arrests and prosecutions in the past have caused any uh, reduction in the risk? Finally, well, you get the idea. When I read, by locking up the perpetrators, the cycle of mounting numbers, rate, and violence of viruses will get a pause and reversal. What's that based on? Is that, is that really true? So I thought, well, I'm going to take a look at what's happened in the past 10 years or so with computer viruses, and I'm going to see if there's any scientific evidence that would support the premise that by doing this thing, we're actually spending money wisely, and this is really going to cause a decrease in the problem. From a little bit about why I got involved with this. Back in 1985 to about 1991, mostly I was interested in, in DOS and LS9, which was a Tandy Coco thing, and Unix systems, and it was a whole lot of fun. And I got a PC complete with a virus, and that was not quite so much fun. None of my friends could help me when I got the virus. I suppose that should say none of my hacker friends could help me with viruses, because the two worlds are pretty far apart, hacking and virus writing. So I sought out the help of people who knew about computer viruses. And this would be antivirus people and virus writers. And that's where all of my troubles started. That's where it all started going kind of crazy. As I started talking to the virus writers, I realized that the good guys were saying that the bad guys were, well, bad. But the bad guys that I was talking to didn't act bad. And I should know because I talked to hundreds of them. But they weren't acting, you know, bad to me. In fact, they were being quite helpful and pleasant and polite. Uh, so I thought, let's do some science about this. So I did the science to find out exactly if these guys were all bad. And the paper got accepted by uh, an organization called Virus Bulletin, which is a magazine that talks specifically about viruses. Their website is www.virusbtn.com. They're very, very good for information about viruses. And the AV guys did not like the results of this study. They did not like it at all. Because it said that the virus writers were actually not all evil, malicious, unethical, antisocial, couldn't get a date if their life depended on it, scum. <laughs> so there I was, you know, with all these people in the antivirus world, and there I was saying, you know, you guys are wrong. And I was one of those kind of outcasts that Richard was talking about earlier. I kept saying this, you know, you guys are wrong. These people are not scum. They're not all sociopaths. This is not true. And I kept saying, yeah, well, you know, you're just as bad as them. But I kept saying the truth. And the truth was that these guys were mostly guys with good social lives, mostly guys that had good relationships with women, mostly some really good, some not so good, just like everybody else. Guys who had good relationships with their parents. Guys who helped in social and community projects. Sometimes pretty cool guys, although a few of them were pretty not cool guys, but very rarely were they not cool. And they were within what we call ethical norms for their ages. And you say, well, 
much that ethical norm stuff. Basically, that's how we describe in the science world of how people make decisions. You know, babies reason differently than kids, and they reason differently than preteens, and they reason differently than teens, and blah, 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 blah. And to find out how people think, we give them a series of ethical dilemmas they have to solve, and they say, well, we think this, and here's why. And a series of tests with numbers, you know, how, how many different ways can you shape four colors, how many plates, if you spin them on the end of rings, did this and that. They take these tests, and you see where they rank on these scales, and, and there are norms for these. By ethically normal, what that means in case of virus writers is that they may come into this virus writing where it says enter here. They participate in the community for a while. They have interactions with other people who write computer viruses. They reconsider what they're doing and they age out. They, they begin to act like the older people who are going out. And new people coming in all the time cycling, write a few viruses. Some people stay mostly just, just a big cycle going around and round and round. Now if this was true, somebody who was at level one two years later would be at level two. The next year would be at level three. The next year would be at level four. And we will watch all of these virus writers. I talked to some, probably 80 or so of them. We will watch them progress up the stages and how their cognitive reasoning abilities changed. So this was a long study, which I did for a long period of time. And finally, we saw, indeed, they were going right up the scale. There were only a couple of exceptions. Adults that did not age out, and they tend to drift off into other more criminal activity instead of just writing computer viruses. Now, what was next? I thought, well, this is pretty interesting stuff. The press really liked it because we were seeing that some of the stereotypes weren't very true and things need to be reconsidered. And we saw that operating systems were becoming more common, you know, more one type. Connectivity was coming everywhere, so the old places where viruses used to come from, or where people said they came from, um, began to shift around. There was a shift in the zones going from, you know, people were looking at Eastern Bloc because they had connectivity, then it was America, then it was Canada, then it was Australia, now it's Indonesia. And where the viruses were coming from was changing. In fact, basically every place the internet came to, the viruses came from. So I, I don't think that's any, you know, big hard rocket science there. It's pretty, makes pretty much sense to me when you've got a computer and you've got connectivity and you've got people talking about things, they're going to talk about things, they're going to do things. That's just how it is. But people, the reason they did this, it was still the same. People were curious. They wanted to do what they called research. And they were making political and social statements in some cases. Vactivism, not hacktivism, V because of virus. Uh, it wasn't just about technical stuff, and this, though, and this is the stuff that really interested me the most. There were some very mixed messages from the media. I mean, when you open a press from maybe 1992, 93, 94, 95, 96, when you read about virus writers, you read about, oh, they're real renegades, they're really bad guys, you know, and, and you know, women they might like bad guys, they like bad boys, so virus writers are bad boys, let's be a virus writer, we're a bad boy, you know, and we're cool. And the media kind of promoted that, that it was a cool thing to do. They also promoted the idea that viruses were incredibly complex. You had to be a real genius to write a virus. Well, I could sit here and write one for you in about less than two minutes. This guy over here that wasn't a fed could write one for you in about 30 seconds. Uh, there are some people, as I look out, that I saw earlier here who could write them for you and have pretty complex viruses in, in a pretty short amount of time. But it doesn't take a rocket science to be able to do it, although in some cases a little more complex. But you don't have to be a genius to write most of this stuff. You know, you just take some, write some macro commands. It's really easy if you get the, well, never mind how to do it. You can't do that. Um, in some cases, it was taunting from the antivirus community. I mean, let me ask you, if I go up to you and say, you know, you guys, you guys are so stupid. You couldn't raise your left hand if your life depended on it. You know, I'm going to start seeing these left hands go up like this. So when you see some guys going out saying, you know, the virus writers obviously are too stupid to know how to use blah, 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 the next thing we see is viruses that do blah, blah, blah. There are also some technical papers written, which in my opinion were more like how-to guides for how to write certain kinds of viruses, which means that virus writing tended to appear to be just a little bit less wrong to people. It appeared to be just a little bit cooler than it probably actually is which means young people weren't aging out, so we're seeing more virus writers and they're getting older. And because they don't age out, older people, people in corporations, just playing around doing what they think are some tests, which usually aren't very good tests and don't really help them, but people do like to play with computers. Pretty soon they're calling somebody to help them out of a jam. They say, oh, you know, I got this virus and I altered it in edit and it's a macrovirus and now it's spread throughout my company and my antivirus software doesn't detect it. Can you please help me? So, you know, this has kind of created a few problems, and they're often calling me, and I really need some sleep. I haven't had any really for three days, so if you're thinking about doing this tonight, please don't, and if you do, don't call me. But there are two viruses in particular that came to attention, Melissa and CIH. Is there anybody here who doesn't know Melissa virus or CIH virus? 
Okay, these are, I like the scripts. I, I tried to make them look kind of like the virus and then listening like a girl in CIH kind of orientalish. That was my creativity. But there's a real mixed message about this whole situation, which is why this t-shirt, this Justice for Day shirt, which I am going to wear, but when I tried it on you guys, it was, it was kind of itchy, so I've got to wash it first. The Melissa author, David Smith, and you can read about him lots of places on the internet, is awaiting a really long sentence and looking at really huge fines for the virus that he admits to writing. But when you read reports of the CIH author, which virus was much more destructive, he got a polite slap on the wrist, he got a good job, and there were press releases saying he's an absolutely brilliant above average programmer. Now this is a real mixed message and a real double standard. And it kind of says to me that in our whole virtual society and community as a whole, we don't really know what we think about this kind of stuff. And people are getting some real mis mixed messages. There are lots of people running scared because of all this. You know, viruses are causing, you know, depending on who you talk to, anywhere from $17,000 damage to trillions and billions, gazillions of dollars of damages. People are running scared. And when people run scared, do you know what the solution is that they look to when they get really, really scared and they don't know what else to do? The Not the bottle. No, close. Uh, no, maybe they should be going for the bottle because their solution is loss. And in this case, um, I was, you get this, this case, the company says virus writing is illegal. The prosecution will be an event that will re release or re reduce virus writing by locking people up. It's going to solve the problem. Now, this is, I'm actually naming this only because I just took this quote before I came. Making a bomb is illegal, but writing about how to make a bomb is not. But with the computer virus, the words are the bomb. And here we have someone uh, on Usenet, and I've got the URLs, so I could give them to you, to look up, suggesting that Congress look at making it illegal to write a computer virus. And I thought, well, you know, how do we know that's really going to solve the problem? How are you going to force that anyway? And there's another fellow, Mish who actually is a good friend of mine, suggests that programs actually aren't speech and therefore shouldn't be protected. So we have some pretty complex issues and pretty high-power people pushing for ideas that may not have the best long-term effect. When we look at viruses in the World Wide Web, we have people saying, got to get rid of them, got to get rid of them all, it's irresponsible, ISPs shouldn't let them up there, people want to make it illegal. But how do you know when something becomes bad? I mean, at what point in the cycle of thinking about virus, hurting somebody with virus, does it become bad? Malice. Well, malice is a subjective judgment, isn't it? Intentional uh, making of damage to someone else? Inten intentional. Intent's kind of a hard thing to prove when you're looking at code. I could write a virus right here and give it to him on a disk and I have no intent to harm anyone. So if all you have is a program to look at, how can you tell what the intent is? Now, even if it says, you know, this is a bad thing meant to harm, it may just be a demonstration. But do we know the impact of this potential law? I mean, how much have we actually looked at it? So let's say we're going to go through a series of things. I did a survey. I had a bad thought. Is that wrong if you have a bad thought? No, it's probably, it's, it's, you think it's wrong if you have a bad thought? Okay, you close your eyes like this. Go you don't think it's a bad thing. You can rush over a man think it's in his heart. There he does. So you had a bad thought. What if you told it to your friend? Is it bad then? What if you wrote it down on your computer? Is it bad then? What if you did it for a class project? These are all the same things you're writing. It's where you write it, make it a bad thing. How about if you put it up on your website, labeled as a virus, so your friends can take a look? Is that bad? How about if you label it as a really cool, nifty disk utility, so the unsuspecting will get it and hurt themselves? Is that bad? Well, maybe they shouldn't be on your website to begin with. How about if you password protect it when you put it up there? Is that bad? I decided that or what I would do is I would ask people here what they thought about what is bad, what is as far as writing a virus, and what the impact of this law would be. So in order to do this and have it be something that would be scientifically valid so people would take it seriously, rather than me just asking a bunch of questions of a bunch of people at a conference, had to choose a target population. This seemed like a good one, people who are pretty open. Had to get a number of responses in a sample set that would give me statistically relevant data so that when I published it, anybody who looks at it from a scientific angle would say, oh, well, this certainly is statistically significant. We need to take a serious look at this. I need to make sure the samples were chosen randomly so that I didn't get three people who were all together so they're all going to think the same way. So we're grabbing people every so often as they come in. And I've done all that now, taken, taken the survey data. I still have to do an analysis using a, a statistical tool, and I'll probably use some sort of analysis of covariance. And I have to interpret the data, which I haven't had time to do yet, and I'll do that before this virus bulletin conference in September. We had some interesting questions. And uh, here are the questions that we asked. We said, if it were to become illegal to write self-replicating code, would you be less likely to do it? Makes no difference. Or more likely to do it? And so we got some really interesting responses. Now, which I won't go into now, but I'll publish them in just a little bit. And how far would you go? Very popular question here at DEF CON. Is thinking about writing a virus your limit of tolerance? 
Is talking about a virus your limit of tolerance? Is writing a virus your limit? How about if you let it escape accidentally? How about if you give it to friends? Interestingly enough, more people thought letting a virus escape accidentally was like the, the worst thing you could do. It was far worse than, you know, than anything. That being stupid is worse than being malicious. And that was very interesting to, to read the comments on that. is putting it up on a site clearly labeled. And I was, I was actually quite surprised because several years ago when I, uh, I think it was last year when we did the panel hand viruses, I asked how many people thought it was okay to put a virus up on a VX site clearly labeled. A lot of people did. But as we started sampling people, many, many people, many more people than last year thought that putting it up even clearly labeled was probably irresponsible, maybe not a good idea. Putting a virus on use not label as a utility, say sexy.exe or like you look at me.com or whatever, and using it to mess up someone's computer really bad. So these are the, the, the questions that we ask. And what we're going to do, uh, as I started looking at this data, there is statistical relevance. The, the, the data is chunked pretty clearly into three very distinct groups with some pretty strong patterns that are starting to emerge. But I need to do a real analysis and correlate the if it were illegal data with the how far would you go data to see if the level of what you find acceptable has any correlation with what if it becomes illegal. Would you change your mind then? It's starting to look now like the lower people's tolerances for posting viruses in public, the more likely they are to totally do a flipping change about if it becomes illegal and actually start writing viruses. So it's kind of a pretty surprising result as I sort through this data. Uh, I still have to interpret it and you know put it through all these complex programs and type in the numbers and it will do all these complex mathematical things for me. So for now, what's been the impact of laws on virus-related incidents? I mean, we, we can look at the number of viruses that are actually out there in the wild. Now, this is not the number that the antivirus companies tell you exist. You'll say, we protect you from, you know, 500 gazillion viruses. Pay no attention to that number. It's an irrelevant number. What really matters to the viruses are actually out there doing problems. And I think there were some viruses that circulated last year on here that have caused people some problems. Uh, the number of viruses causing the problems in the wild and chart the activity of post-arrest sentencing and, and the different press. On these four guys, Dr. Pop, Christopher Pyle, the CIH guy whose name I can't pronounce, which is why I didn't write it, and Smith. So we look at viruses. You see these lines here, this, this yellow line at the top represents the total number of viruses that have been found out in the wild reported to this organization called the Wildest Organization. I work with them. They get reports from like over 55 people that work out in the field with viruses. Users report to them. They report to us. This blue number is viruses reported by two or more people. Those are viruses that are actually spreading out in the wild. And the red and green numbers down here, the, the red is the new since the last time the list was published, with green being normalized, because sometimes we'd skip a month, so we had to normalize the data. These are the important numbers, the viruses that are new every month. And if we look here, at, back over here in a long time ago, when Dr. Pop was arrested, we see that there was not really a drop off in the viruses after he was arrested. We look here at when Christopher Powell was arrested, and I don't know about you guys, but when I look at that, it looks to me like it goes up, and it never goes down lower, any point on the time chart where it would look like it was related to that arrest. Get over here to David Smith, you see that it went up, and it did come back down afterwards. People could have gotten a little shaky, but... Overall, this looks like the noise is just pretty constant. There's, there's really nothing that's statistically significantly showing here that these arrests and public relations have had any, have had any impact on the amount of viruses, new viruses getting released that actually cause problems. And over here, the CIH author, you know, after him, not even zoom, you know, I mean, it's obviously, if you, they're going up all the time. They're not coming back down. So it doesn't look like there's any clear pattern of these convictions and these high-profile arrests and these stiff penalties and all this other stuff they're talking about. It doesn't look like it's having very much of an impact at all. So I think it will be really interesting to see when we put this data together if people with a low virus tolerance believe a law against virus writing would increase the likelihood they'd write a virus. I think it would be really interesting to to see what an appropriate penalty for this guy might be for, for David Smith. And we did ask that in a survey, different sur set of survey questions. And that data is still being brought in and correlated. We've got uh, quite a few responses there. Um, and, and the range of penalties people suggest are he should get community service, he should get 10 years of hard time. Um, I can't say what my opinion is because it would bias the survey, but probably you can mostly guess. Um, if the number of viruses in the World Wide Web for distribution increases, decreases, or stays the same after Mr. Smith's sentencing, 
Um, we started by using the Google search, search engine and looking for all the viruses, all the virus sites where you type in viri. How many do you see where there are actual live viruses? We found that about, um, I think it was maybe 15% of them actually had live viruses. So we're going to also measure that the same way after the arrest and sentencing. Um, of Mr. Smith, which has been post postponed several times now, and uh, we're hoping that it comes in August before I have to actually present this data. Now, what do I think? And people ask me this all the time, press people ask, because somehow I've become this expert on computer virus sweaters, I guess because it actually mattered to me. I didn't like people calling people names and putting out stereotypes that seemed unfair about people that were always perfectly decent to me. Um, people are looking for a specific law as a solution to a big problem. I think that there's probably no scientific evidence, at least yet, to show that that law is actually going to help with the problem. From this data that we collected here, it looks like there may be evidence to show, or at least support the hypothesis, that making these sorts of laws would make the problem worse. But who can really blame people when the viruses are causing so much problem out there to business corporations? I mean, they want a solution. And, and so what should the solution be? Now, what do I think? I think that viruses are indeed very cool the first time you ever see how they work. I mean, people say viruses aren't cool, they're boring. That's because they've been doing it for a while. The first time you see a program make a copy of itself and do something like that, it's pretty cool. But after that, it's pretty boring. And you have to weigh that coolness factor off with the responsibility factor of what you're doing. I think that virus writing, per se, and, and I'm not talking about writing of self-replicating programs in university or research environments, but just, you know, virus writing and putting it up on some VX website, that's not research, that's not rocket science, it's not helpful, it's not about artificial life, artificial intelligence, it's not about solving any interesting new problems, it's just stripping out some macro code, changing a few things around, posting it out, and before you know it, it's costing companies tons and tons of money. That's not a cool thing, that's a pretty sucking thing. Viruses can cause really big problems, and I think that it's irresponsible to make them publicly available because unlike with exploits and tools, which you will put them up and somebody can get them and mess with them and you're making a choice each time with the virus, once you get it going, it's like the gift that keeps on giving. You can't say, oh, I wish I could stop it now because once it's out there, you can't control it. It's going to keep going. But I think that doesn't have to make it a matter of law. Finally, and because I've gone so fast, I think we finished just about on time. I really think that what you do on your own computer is your own business, but that's really only for now. In some countries, it's already illegal to write a computer virus. And one of those companies, co companies, one of those countries was in the Netherlands. I have a list of those countries on some research I did before, and I've misplaced the paper, which is why I don't have the list for you here now. But if you want it to remain what's on your computer being your own business, you have to remember that you have to act responsibly. If you're going to be experimenting with viruses and people are going to do it, don't leave things laying around where some idiot can get a hold of it and go out and use it to hurt people. Because then you'll be giving scaremongers and people who want to stereotype viruses and people who write programs, give them ammunition to go out and ask for laws. When people are scared and they see a solution, you know, they're going to grab a hold of it. So you need to really protect yourself by acting responsibly and don't give people any ammunition to put laws into effect that ultimately is just a tiny wedge into what is your freedom. Because if today they don't like the fact that you're going to write a computer virus, so they're going to say if you write a virus it's illegal, maybe tomorrow they won't like that you write an exploit. And what the next day, maybe they don't like something else you write. So I mean, if every time that something they don't like becomes illegal, they being whoever they are in power at the time, probably would be a very bad thing. So if you act responsibly and don't just put viruses out there, you're going to be doing everybody a really big favor as far as what information is allowed to keep free. And that's my really fast presentation, I think. Yep, that's it. Well, any self-replicating program would qualify as a virus. Now, I personally prefer viruses and assembler um, just because I think that you actually have to write the, pro <laughs> the program if I were going to prefer a virus. Uh, but the macroviruses, I mean, it's just exercises. To me, it's just exercises and stupidity. But that is not true. Macroviruses in the early 90s, uh, when uh, DOS just came out, writing viruses was actually the top technology. You learned the uh, internals of the file system. You found ways to make yourself still so DOS didn't know that you were allocating memory out of its own heap. You could hide yourself in DOS buffers. There was the 512 virus. A major breakthroughs that uh, established the way to uh, better programming skills in, in that operating system. Now, since I was involved in these things in the early 90s, I really can't say anything about the, micro, the microviruses that are going out now. Personally, I don't think of them as viruses. 
because, like you said, some idiot. <laughs> Did I say some idiot? <laughs> it does some modifications, and there you go. You got a new screen. But back in the early 90s, that was really good work, and people were making real good progress and doing amazing stuff with the cell and now, I think that's really true, but I also think that in those days, the part of the programs that made them viral was simply find first, find next, and you can do that in two lines of code. So I think you could have done the viral part. I mean, you could have done all the other parts of things that were done in viruses without making them replicate. The replication was the trivial part I mean, as far as the programming. Viruses like the 4K, the uh, whale, establish new skill uh, techniques that weren't even thought of by, by uh, operating system programmers. I, I disagree that... Uh, Facing the virus on the fine first and fine next uh, is, is uh, considered virus-wrecking. Not to mention that a lot of viruses never actually caused any damage. They just proliferated, and you got to take that into consideration. Not all virus writers actually sought to inflict damage. I agree with you 100% that not all virus writers seek to do damage. Um, I think that's one of the stereotypes that uh, my initial research showed was true, that in most cases it was ex intellectual curiosity or exercise. And in many cases, people, even who don't mean to cause damage, don't realize the impact of what they're doing over the large scale. So even when their virus got out, and before they know it, it's everywhere. In many cases, in early days, it wasn't at all intentional, I believe. I agree with you. Yes, in the very back. Hi. That expression, that computer code is an expression of speech and is legal. Yes, I am. I talk about it in the actual research paper from which these were taken. Um, but there are people who are saying that viruses should be exempted from that protection, that they should not be given the same form of First Amendment protection. And you know, not all speech, there is, it's speech, there's lots of speech, but not all speech is protected speech. There are things you, you can't say or do legally, things that aren't protected, and it's really conceivable that if there's a strong enough push to make writing a computer virus a non-protected speech, you know, that could happen. Not my idea, dude. <laughs> Not my idea. I'm just reporting the news. Yes. Do you think that this, this world gets more wired and the amount of damage caused by viruses in the wild increases that they will kind of adopt these? And because of the way they operate, once you let them out, they just kind of go. They'll kind of adopt the same kind of social pariah as landmines have adopted. <laughs> <laughs> I think certainly one thing that I've observed over the past several years is that, you know, the, the hacker community and the, the virus community are kind of separate communities. You know, there's some merging of the communities, but the, the, hacker, the virus writers have tended to be at the lower end of the scale and kind of looked down upon because, you know, the stuff does damage, even though we say, we, you know, we think it, it's not intended to do damage. It's kind of like the sucking part of, of the underground technology. So I think it probably will continue to be looked more down upon unless people behave more responsibly with it. I think if people behave more responsibly with what they're doing, don't just leave it laying out there where somebody can get it and it just keeps going. It's possible it might not have to be looked upon as some sort of you know, bad, evil, unethical, malicious, antisocial act. Way in the back in the white shirt. What is that law? Illegal to transmit a virus? I guess I'm a criminal. Yeah. I mean, the people that work with the antivirus stuff all the time, we have to transmit the viruses, don't we? How, how do we differentiate? It's illegal for me to give him one, but it's not illegal for me to give some a antivirus guy one. It's all about a matter of intent and who's interpreting the intent. And I think that's where the real concern really, really is. Yes. Could you touch on all the study about how even though black classes may not be well written, some people's opinion that they show flaws in operating system models as well as email clients, i.e. Microsoft. Um, could you could they touch about that at all? The firefighter was sometimes at the front line and notifying people about security risks. I did talk about that a little bit. I talked about it more in, in a paper, and actually the paper's linked to the new security focus website. I think, uh, 
has a link to that paper. It's called When Worlds Collide. And it's about the different views that the antivirus and the traditional security community have on whether or not demonstrating these vulnerabilities. You know, programs generally don't have to be viral to, to demonstrate the vulnerability. You can demonstrate most of these vulnerabilities straight away. The virus just, it's the, it's the part that really is the problem because it gets going out of your control. But there's a little bit about the differing views on information sharing and what's okay and what's not. The communities actually, just like the virus writer and the hacker communities have different models of how they behave. The antivirus community and the security community have so far been pretty much distinct, different organizations. We're starting to see the antivirus acting as a function of the general security corporations. We're seeing, you know, security corporations bring antivirus up under that so that it's all one thing, which is probably good for the users. The, the two worlds, in, in my opinion, never were separate, but you know, they, they have been separate. We need to really work to bring them together because there's a lot of knowledge, different skill sets in those two communities. Yes? Well, I, I've done some work now with them. With them, is there a, a lot of us are, are trying to do some work with the folks at Microsoft on some of these issues, and there really are effective ways of getting the changes made without pelting out five billion viruses everywhere. You know, I'd say try a letter first. You know, it's 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 you be, it's been working more than I think people are aware. Yes. Fortunately, I think that Windows probably isn't a virus. It's not spreading so much anymore. We're seeing more and more Linux systems. <laughs> it's probably a really good uh, product. It's killing it off. That's my own personal view, not that of IBM. Yes? Well, I guess you heard it right there. David Smith is an excellent script writer, and known as Vicodin ES. And uh, he's looking at doing lots of time in jail for releasing a virus that he admits to having written. Um, as far as him being just a normal guy like everybody else, most of my research anyway has shown that most people who do this stuff are just pretty much with, they could be just the guy next door, anybody. It's not, it doesn't take some special, you know, evil, malicious, horrible, Person. It's not some guy sitting in the basement listening to Danzig all day and night. So, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just a guy. And sometimes it's just a guy at school, a guy who works for an ISP. It could be anybody. It's not, you know, devil behind the door. Sorry, I can hear you. The virus. It doesn't self-replicate. It doesn't even install itself again. One, one final question over there. I think that in order to have a functional operating system, you're going to have to be allowed to write at some place on the file system and make copies. And as long as you can do that, you're going to have the potential to have a virus. So don't think it's really the issue of operating system manufacturers. I think that the culpability in, in the case of viruses lies in a lot of places. It's what you do with the thing that you create. And um, I think we need to look a lot more at personal responsibility and what we do with our creations instead of looking elsewhere for who's responsible. We need to look at ourselves. I'm sorry, one, one final last question. Uh, going back to this question, just sort of following up, I'm not in the case of the love bug virus, but that was not even the, one of the most basic uh, exploits on uh, Olay calls and DB script. Now, that's why we do it. They left open, you know, doing things that 
no one possibly need to do I don't know what everybody needs to do. Um, I certainly couldn't recommend any kind of action of holding an operating system manufacturer responsible. Probably would be interesting to see what happened if anybody did, but I don't know that anybody's doing that. Do you know? I'm not going to sue Microsoft. You're not going to sue Microsoft? Why not? <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> All right. Well, if anybody has any questions about the, the research or the later research or this study, now this project from here will be on the DEF CON site probably. And if you look at the IBM, www.av.ibm.com, the paper will be there or you can contact me. Um, I've got a bunch of email addresses. You just type Sarah Gordon and virus in a search engine and you'll find me somewhere hopefully, if I'm around and if I haven't given up on all this insanity by then. So thank you very much for coming, and uh, bye.